Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What do you think? If you uh, haven't been here uh, before, you won't notice a difference. But for those of us who have been here before, what a beautiful difference. We're able to add more chairs here, set it up to handle more capacity. So it's really exciting. Thank you very much for Doug and all the team that worked yesterday morning to make this happen. So give them a hand, please. Thank you so much. Where, where are you, Doug? He's hiding somewhere back there. Oh, he's over there. There he goes. He's one of our greeters this morning. So my name is Steve Bachter. I'm the pastor here at Northside Community Church. Welcome. If you're a guest here, it's so awesome to have you here. I would just ask if you're able to, just go right on our website at northsidecommunitychurch.ca and just click new here and fill out the guest card. Just so we know you're here, you'll get a reply back email that says thank you so much for coming and a little bit of extra information as well how you can keep in touch with us through social media as well in that email. So if you don't mind, that'll be awesome. And we like to have some fun here at Northside Community Church. And uh, I'm just waiting for someone to walk through those back doors because it is her yesterday. I hope I'm allowed to say this, but she turned 82 years young yesterday. Where's Betty? Come on down, Betty. Here comes Betty. Woo! Come on down, Betty. We're telling everybody it's your birthday. Woo! There we go. So we, we like to have a little bit of fun here. So we're going to soon sing a very popular song that gets sung during people's birthdays. Oh, you want to play it? There we go. But it's not just Betty's birthday yesterday. I just found out that another young woman, another young, right, Betty? Another young woman turned 12 yesterday. Some people might not know who you are. Delilah, do you want to stand up? Delilah turned 12 yesterday. Woo! So we're gonna we're gonna all sing together happy birthday to Betty. So we're gonna say Betty and Delilah, all right? So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Betty and Delilah. Happy birthday to you. Woo! That is so awesome. That's uh, so awesome. I'm just a few years older than you, Delilah. Just a few years older. Anyways. All kids ages six and older, you guys can go downstairs to your kids' program. Parents, if it's your first time here and you want to go check out uh, where they're going, please feel free to follow the crowd, and you can go check it out and come on back up as well. Um, I think that's it for now. So this morning, uh, I'm giving you guys a treat, right? Ready for the treat? You're not going to hear me preach. Don't all applaud at once. Okay, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. yay, okay, all right. <laughs> But this morning, uh, we're going to hear a story of God's miracles in the life of a couple and their family. Uh, Gord and Sharon Skopnik. Gord Skopnik is one of our elders. They'll tell them about, more about themselves. So I'm not going to steal any of their thunder. But Gord and Sharon have just amazing stories of God's grace in their lives, of how God moved in their lives, and the miracles they've seen happening. And listen to their stories, because maybe at some point, you're going to hear something that will be a source of encouragement, a source of hope, maybe even a challenge for each and every one of us. So Gordon, Sharon, give them a hand as they come up. Hi, everybody. I'm the happy guy. I'm happy to take this off. That's what I'm happy about. Praise the Lord. So um, we, we are missionaries. We are workers here in the church we have some cards uh, for at the end if you want to take these cards home to pray for us and to to check us out online okay so Marv's gonna start a presentation and there we go so today we're gonna share how God raises broken people to proclaim his kingdom for his glory In the story I'm going to share, if people were not praying for transformation, what happened would never have happened. In the story I am about to share, these stories that you're going to hear today, if people were not praying for these transformations, they would never have happened. My life 
was the epitome of brokenness. You know, God works in our lives in many ways. Sharon and I have seen miracles of even a resurrection in our own family when our daughter was raised from the dead. But I'll share that story in just a bit. I'd like to share my story first. You know, we all have stories, and each story is our story, to give God glory. I, I was brought up in a very broken home. My mother had eight children. I have, have never met some of them. Both my parents were alcoholics. So many times as a child, I was abandoned. I lived in a logging camp the first years of my life. I would just wander as a toddler, three years old, out into the bush, in the camp. One time I was sitting on a bridge, and a bear was coming over the bridge. So a logger ran, scooped me up, and then another logger shot the bear. And I didn't get scooped up, I guess. I, um, by the time I was only a little, little child, five years old, I mean, I was abandoned. I would, I would leave the house. I would go for hikes. We had an abandoned mine nearby our town, our village. And I would go to that mine, and I would just go searching and, like, exploring. And I'd look through the mine shafts and see other shafts below. And, you know, a kid that didn't know nothing just doing stupid stuff, doing stupid stuff. And my home, it was just pathetic. It was just so broken. My parents would have parties, and we lived in a trailer, so the party, parties got wilder and wilder, and pretty soon furniture and dishes, whatever, they were slamming against the wall on my bedroom in the trailer. I would just lie in bed, and I would just cry. I'd just cry. By the time I was eight years old, I was drinking hell hard al alcohol from the bottle. Rum, whiskey, vodka, anything I could get my hands on. My stomach bled. And it would bleed until my lips turned blue and my fingernails were blue and my mom would go, hmm, guess we should take you to the hospital. And after a basin of blood, my parents took me to the hospital and I get blood transfusions. And that's, that's sort of how my life was through the years. Just bleed, go to the hospital, get blood transfusions. By the time I was 14 years old, I was already deep into crime. I was deep into drugs. I was distributing drugs to juveniles. I was stealing cars. I was a rebel, at least against authority. But then my brother committed suicide with a high-powered rifle. And I know that my parents were broken, and they probably didn't even know what they were doing. And I have reconciled with my parents before they have gone, but my parents gave me that rifle as a gift. And that sent me on an emotional roller coaster. And I got angry. And I got more rebellious. And by the t time I was 19 years old, I ran away from home. I bought a four-wheel drive, I went driving up to northern British Columbia, and I just kept on driving until I seen a, a local mine, and I stopped in and said, you got work? They said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll work here. You know, 12-hour shifts, no accountability, I could do drugs on the job, great place, great place to work. Well, at least I thought so. One night, I was walking out of the bar, and I seen a little book on the ground. It was brand new. <laughs> I thought it was an address book so I could make some prank calls and, you know, fool around. So I opened the little book up, and it's a New Testament. I went, ah, this is religion. I closed that little book. I was going to huck it. But you got to know me. <laughs> if I find something new on the street... <laughs> I keep it. <laughs> so I kept it. And I started to read it after work, and I was reading about Jesus. You know, Jesus, Jesus did, like, kind acts. He was compassionate. He wept. He did miracles. 
He even raised people from the dead. And I thought, what a bunch of my brother's names is Brian Scott. Uh, that's BS. <laughs> but I kept on reading. And I read about Jesus. And I read some of Paul's stuff. And I got to 2 Corinthians. And I kept reading. And I came to a passage in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And the Holy Spirit came on my life and brought me to my knees, and I started weeping. I just started crying. I just started begging God, if these words are true, if this Jesus is real, real, make me new, clean me. And I fell asleep on the floor that night, totally exhausted. When I woke up the next day, I felt peace, something I'd never experienced my whole life. I got on the bus to go to the mine to go to work, and I just, I didn't know what happened. Something happened. I got to work, I said to my guys, guys, something happened. Like, there's something happening in me. I, I, I read this book, and I brought a few of those guys to Jesus, by the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, and that night was a night of healing. God healed me. He freed me from substance abuse overnight. My stomach never bled again. And I, I, I was so overwhelmed with God's, God's message and God's new peace. I, just, I went into the village and I thought, there's got to be other people that believe this book. I can't be the only one. So I went around in the village and I'm looking for a place where other people believe this book and and I see, well, there's a Pentecostal place, and there's an Anglican place, and there's a Catholic place. But I seen one place that said Bible Chapel. I thought, I got one of those. <laughs> I didn't go to that place. <laughs> so I go trucking into that little church, and, and they, they start witnessing to me, and I'm going, oh, no, I'm okay, I think. I got, I got the message, you know, like, I want to just know more. And I went to the elders, will you meet with me? And the elders said, when would you like to meet? And I said, I want to meet every night. <laughs> they said, uh, we work. I said, well, I work too. One of the elders said, you know what? You need to go to a learning institute. I go, what's that? He goes, you can go to a place where you study the Bible every day. I thought, oh, that sounds cool. I think I'm going to do that. So he gave me a bunch of catalogs, and I filled out those applications and sent them off, and I got two of those colleges reply, one from British Columbia, one from southern Saskatchewan, where I met a lovely bride, by the way. She's very pretty. And uh, I got accepted. So what am I going to do? You know, as a, as a new believer, all I knew was meeny, meeny, miny, mo. That's, that was the, my decision-making process. <laughs> But I got on the bus. I went to this village where this school was near. I got off the bus with another guy, and there was a group of people there. They met me, and they said, are you Gord? I go, yeah, who are you? Well, we're a delegation of the third year class of this institute, and we've been praying for you. We've been praying that God would bring you to Christ and that God would bring you to this school. And that sent shivers up my back. And I said, God, I don't know. But whatever you say, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'm on board. I'm ready. That was the beginning of a journey where I would see God work miracles in ways through my life and ministry by the power of prayer. You see, People I didn't even know were praying for me, for my salvation, that I would come to that specific school. So prayer is just one facet of the ministry. But I also want to share how I was redeemed to work with broken people. This also was a whole process of leading me to work with broken people. 
And we, Sharon and I, have worked with refugees now for the last 33 years. The next video will help you understand who we are working with, because a picture is worth a thousand words. And South Sudan became a nation in 2011 after 50 years of war and unrest. It is still a war zone. I can't believe it. With a population of 12.5 million people, 7.5 million people are refugees in that country. Half the population are refugees. It's a broken place. So our, our team of nationals and Sharon and I work in this place. I experienced a personal resurrection from a seemingly spiritual death to life through the power of prayer. Many of those people that you see, we've seen miracles there in that place. We've worked, we've worked in missions now for 32 years, as I mentioned, or 33. We've seen many miracles in Africa. But I was starting to complain to God. I don't know if any of you have ever complained to God, but I was starting to complain. God, you do miracles over there, but you don't do any here. God, like, are you not working here or what? Right? I was actually complaining. So we'd like to share another story. We've seen a miracle of a resurrection in our own country, in our own family, when our daughter was raised from the dead, and it was evident to all. We'd like to introduce this story with a video from a series of videos that were produced by the London Press. And if you ever want any links or those stories live, you can just ask me and I'll, I'll get those to you. And then we would like to share some of the missing details, including the factor of how prayer was a big part of this story. just a concrete culvert at the side of the road. One of those structures along Highway 401 that motorists pass all the time without even recognizing them. But on February 12, 2017, that culvert 
changed Ashlyn Krell's life. Ashlyn, a 28-year-old London woman, was driving home from Waterloo after visiting some family. She hit some ice on a very cold and very stormy night along that stretch of the highway near London. Her car, a blue Toyota Corolla, went down the ditch and hit that culvert. After that violent collision, it flipped. And beside that culvert in a hole that was dug for the construction was five feet of runoff water. Ashlyn was under the water for at least 27 minutes before the first responders got her out. By all accounts, she should be dead, but she's alive. This is the story of what happened about the heroics of civilians, police officers, paramedics, firefighters, a tow truck operator, all those people who converged that night at that little spot near Veterans Memorial Parkway. I remember seeing Perry standing on top of the roof of the, the car with the ax, and uh, I'll try and watch my language here, but <clears throat> if you imagine the scenario, I, I, three of the largest people and the strongest people I know is in the car, Perry, Emad, and, and Wrenches, and they can't get into it. And it's like... It's frustrating. For me, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, not being disrespectful, I'm thinking, right, okay, so working hard isn't working. Like, we have to start working smart and think, how do we do this? It had been more than five minutes that Ashlyn Krell had been submerged in her car. The water is right up to the floorboards of the car. The proximity to the cement and the dirt, like, you're in amazement for a first second. Like, how did this happen right off the bat? How, how, did, how did this happen? I just remember thinking, like, how was there a car upside down in this perfectly fit little spot? And you saw it. It was inches, you know, either way. Yeah, so anyway, the tow guy goes, they're doing their hookup, the fire guys are there, they're, they're putting their jaws alive, and they're trying to breach where I had been, and they, they realize the same thing. No matter what they do, you can't get in there. There's not enough room on either side. How long have they been under? Nine minutes, ten minutes. Okay, okay. Once the car now comes over and the door just kind of flopped open because we already had that undone while it was underwater. When the car kind of flips over, you see, I saw, uh, you know, the Ashton laying there across the driver, on the driver's seat, sitting on the driver's seat, lying on the passenger seat, lifeless. Seat belt on. Seat belt on. Yeah, strapped in. That's probably why she stayed in that position. And so you couldn't see her face because she had her hoodie up and it was right around her face. And um, so they get her out of the vehicle and I'm, I'm happy there's only one. And they get her out, they get her on the stretcher and I actually got to help because the firemen, they're all, there's guys in the vehicle, there's guys all over and they're passing and that's what we do. And I happen to be at the end of the line. So I put her on the gurney with another guy and I pulled her hood back. So I took her hood and I pulled it back and there she was. And you get to see her face for the first time and her eyes were open. And it's, you know, that dead fish look is what I call it. When you go fishing and you got a fish in your boat and right in her eyes, they're just fixed, dilated, there's no reaction. I got my big light on and nothing's happening. And, you know, she's pale as can be and the lips are blue and uh, her hair's all wet and there's like mud on her and whatnot. And uh, I thought, yeah, she's gone. And I remember saying, I said to somebody, she's gone. Wet, soggy. Uh, I know it's a girl. I know she's not old. I know that she's fairly young. And she's somebody's daughter. Yeah. So. I'm a religious person. I believe in God. And I was like, you know what? Everything happens for a reason. And whoever's in that car, their day is today. And that's it. It's done. It's a done deal. They didn't know it waking up this morning, but I know it right now that this person is, is not here with us anymore. This person's not here with us anymore. So a phrase that you hear over and over in the video, the idea, is that how could this happen? How, how could this car flip upside down into this hole of water that's exactly the width of the car so that you can't get the doors open and you can't help? And all we can say is that God had a plan in place. Why was it that Ashland's lips turned blue? 
and she was gone just like years before her dad's lips had been blue and had to go to the hospital to get blood transfusion. Why did Ashlyn have to be completely gone, drowned, and dead? And all we can say is that God had a plan. And that plan made it obvious that he was the one that was going to bring life and healing. Ashlyn had to be completely dead so that God could be glorified in making her completely whole again. So as, as you heard, we work with refugees. So at the time, Gordon and I were in northern Uganda working with refugees, and we got the call, and we were told that our daughter Ashlyn had had an accident. It was pretty bad. They didn't know if she was even going to make it. So we scrambled to, um, to pack up our things, uh, look for a driver and a, a vehicle to take us the day's journey south to the international airport so that we could get home. We left there with questions in our minds, tension in our bodies, prayers in our hearts and on our lips, tears. And our dear African brothers and sisters began to pray. And as people were being made aware of the situation, um, they also joined up in prayers, and there's prayers being lifted up around the world. So when our African friends were praying, people here in Canada were sleeping, and when they woke up here and began praying, others slept. But it became this sort of 24-hour prayer cycle, prayers for Ashlyn. Ashlyn was completely dead, but on the way uh, to the hospital in the ambulance, God brought back a pulse. And at the hospital, they worked really hard um, to get her stabilized and put her on life support. But the first ones to arrive, um, we weren't here yet. And so it was Ashton's husband, Brayden, and our two boys, and some family friends that were willing to go. And so they were the first ones to arrive at the hospital. And the, of course, things were looking really bad. And the doctor told them they would, they would need, uh, need, actually need to think about taking her off the life support because there was just so much damage. And even if she did survive, like, they didn't know what kind of quality of life she would have. Um, Dustin, our oldest son, was there. And uh, Can you he go back, Mark, to that boy? And he, uh, he wrote some of his thoughts yeah. about that day. Back one more. Uh, just oh. go forward now. There you go. There we go. There's Dustin. And he wrote down some of his thoughts of that, that, uh, that day. It was the most dreadful place I'd ever been. Everyone hugged each other, and there was lots of crying. And after what seemed like a hopeful update, the doctor came to inform us that Ashlyn wasn't going to make it. I felt like crawling into a dark hole and staying there for the rest of my life. He brought us to see her one last time, and that's when I really cried and was grateful that our family friends were there too to support us. The doctor then told us there was nothing more he could do for Ashlyn, and we had to think about the next steps of maybe taking her off of the life support. And every time he mentioned it, I flinched and frowned. And, and then he gave Ashton's husband, Brayden, the ultimate decision. I wanted to yell at the doctor, stop pushing it. Can't you see she's still breathing? I guess because she was on the machine. Well, it kind of came out just as, can you please just wait till my parents get back first? That seemed good enough for... Um, for Ashley, or for Braden, and uh, his mom whispered in his ear that that was probably a good idea. So God was definitely in the room, and the next few days were the most I've ever prayed in my life. And so many other people joined us in prayer for Ashlyn to heal miraculously. So those were his words. And that's what happened. People around the world began to pray, and they were praying. And it took Gordon and I uh, two days to get back to Canada from Africa, 
And when we arrived in Toronto, we went directly to Victoria Hospital in London, where Ashlyn was in the hospital bed with tubes attached to her body on, uh, on the ventilator um, in, the, in an induced coma. She was extremely swollen, practically unrecognizable, even for, for us, her parents. But we sat at her bedside and we, we prayed in the days and weeks ahead, reading scripture and singing songs over her. Nobody knew if she would wake up or when she would wake up out of that coma. Nobody knew what the brain damage would be. All that they could tell us was if she did, there would be a long road of recovery ahead of her. Meanwhile, our, um, our second daughter, Alyssa, was, and her husband were, um, were in Africa as well. They were on a short-term mission in Botswana. And at some point, um, well, it took them four days to arrive back because they were quite remote and had to take numerous planes and buses and things to get back to Canada. But at one point, after they were back, and there was some of the family was just sitting in the waiting room, as, as was the, is what happened every day, <laughs> either sitting with Ashlyn or waiting in the waiting room. And this particular day, Alyssa got a text message on her phone, and she was kind of like shocked and like, what? And this message was from her sister, Ashlyn. Who was in a coma in the other room. And Ashlyn's had sent it to her to encourage her in, in just as they were out doing mission, just to encourage her and, and, for, and so for some reason, maybe because um, Alyssa was out, you know, they were out in, in the boonies and maybe no internet and, and not in range. Well, this text arrived very late and I would call it divinely delayed because as we were sitting there in the waiting room, this is what the text read, and it was a verse from Psalm chapter 42, verse 8, which says, Each day the Lord pours his unfailing love on me, and through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. Whoa. <laughs> we were just, you know, tears were coming, and, and we just, even though Ashlyn was in the next room, still and unmoving, here was this encouragement and this verse that God had delayed purposely for sure and, and brought it to us just at the right time to give us so much hope that indeed um, Ashlyn, God would give her life. Such an encouragement. So day by day, God would give us little encouragements in Ashlyn's condition. As people around the world were praying, I was getting notices from Russia, from China, from South America, from Europe, Italy, France, Germany. People were saying, you don't know us, but we're praying. You don't know me, but this has brought me closer to God. You don't know us, but this has brought us to know Jesus. Just powerful powerful prayers being made. And the fact is, we appreciated the doctors and the team so much, but God was always ahead. Whenever the police said, well, she's dead, God said, mm -mm. the doctor would say, sorry, we have to take her off life. God said, mm -mm. one of the doctors said, we, we did a scope and she has dead bowel, and we're so sorry we have to operate, and we're going, oh, okay, whatever you say, sir. They operate, the doctor comes back, he goes, hmm. well, um, we relieved some pressure, uh, but we couldn't find the dead bowel, because God was always ahead. And it was just fascinating. The main doctor, he would come in, he goes, well, cross your fingers today. We would say, no, 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 no. We pray. We don't cross our fingers. He would sort of giggle. We were grateful for them, though. But we were on an emotional roller coaster. 
and when Ashlyn finally started coming out of the coma. And though her brain was foggy, she was identifying composers of music that she had played previously. She was doing math problems. She was mouthing German because she still had the trach. Mouthing German, her, one of her languages that she speaks uh, to her friend, like she was quoting Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun. Ashlyn was certainly alive. And she was moved out of the ICU into her own, own room and continued recovery. But the recovery only took four weeks. And then Ashlyn, though she had a crushed pelvis and, and <coughs> she had a sustained injury, she walked out of the hospital four weeks later, pain-free. Pain <laughs> In fact, the first doctor, the one that had recommended that she be taken off life support, he was in another ward and he said to his colleague, you know, I should go visit that girl. Uh, the one that had that accident and drowned and she's got a long, long journey of recovery ahead of her. And the colleague said, uh, Ashlyn? Everybody knew the story, it seemed. Oh no, she's, 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 she's being released today. He goes, that's impossible. He dropped his portfolio, ran to Ashlyn's room to sit with her, just to see her. And he sat with her and he said something that he would never say. Somebody's watching out over you. And then he said, you've changed the way I practice medicine. No matter how bad something looks, I will never give up. <laughs> Amen. And you know, it... It just stories like this over and over. She went back to the doctor to check her incision, and it was healing so much. The whole ward was sort of looking around, you know, seeing what, what's going on. Doctor goes, man, you were just healing so incredibly fast. And then he throws up his arms. He goes, what can we say? You're the miracle, girl. And the whole ward just breaks out in clapping. <laughs> and these are, these are the things that, that were encouragements. I took Ashlyn and her husband back to the precinct where these officers were. The officers that said, she's gone. She's dead. We walked in with Ashlyn walking in, and these big guys just started weeping. And uh, we gave them a copy of Courageous, and we, we, we encouraged them and prayed over them, and uh, listened to their, their hearts and how they felt. And uh, these big, burly guys, they s testified of God's work in Ashland's life and the exceptional recovery. So some of you already know Ashland, but she's here today. So Ashland, you can stand up and wave and show people you are alive in God. <laughs> yeah. So if you do have any questions for, um, for Ashlyn herself, she is, by God's grace, not traumatized at all by her accident, and she's very free and willing to talk to people about it. So um, you are welcome to do that. And as Gord said, he also um, has some links uh, to some of the articles and videos from the London Press. If you're interested, you can ask him for those. But um, what was God's purpose? for a resurrection miracle. A while after the accident, we were back in our home here in Waterloo, and I was just doing my devotions and reading, and, and I was in, in Joshua, came to Joshua chapter four, and you might remember the story, it's the one with the Jordan River, and the Israelites are about ready to cross into the promised land, and God, you know, parts the waters once again so that they can cross over the Jordan River. And um, God, uh, God says, or was it Joshua? Joshua tells them, you take one man from each of your tribes and go. And uh, this is what he says in Joshua chapter 4, verse 5. He said, um, he told them, go to the middle of the riverbed where the sacred ark is and pick up a large rock. Carry it on your shoulder to our camp. There are 12 of you, so there will be one rock for each tribe. Someday, your children will ask, 
Why are these rocks here? Then you can tell them how the water stopped flowing when the chest was being carried across the river. These rocks will always remind our people of what happened here today. The rocks were to be the reminder. And then if we skip over to um, a little further in the passage in, in verse 20, it says, the men who had carried the 12 rocks from the Jordan brought them to Joshua and they made them into a monument. Then Joshua told the people, years from now, your children will ask why these rocks are here. Tell them, the Lord our God dried up the Jordan River so we could walk across. He did the same thing here for us that he did for our people at the Red Sea. But why? In verse 24, because he wants everyone on earth to know how powerful he is, and he wants us to worship only him. And that just spoke to me as I was thinking about Ashlyn's accident and like, why, why Ashlyn, many other folks, many other parents had lost children and not every story turns out with the, the ending that you hope for. And it was just God saying, you know, it's nothing to do with you really, it's just all about me and I want people to know, I want to be glorified, I want them to know that I am powerful and I want them to worship me. So God calls us, like those, that pile of rocks, that monument, calls us to remember, to remember what he does. Remember that he is powerful and that he's the one that deserves all of our worship. And I looked up worship just to see what are some other words for worship. Deep respect, praise, glory, honor, and adoration. And I love that word, adoration, because it's just a whole nother level of, of, of worship. But that's what God wants, and that's what he deserves. There are so many um, difficult things, especially in this last few years, and, and even today, that such hard things going, around, going on around us. And, and perhaps even today, you're feeling some of those things, heavy-hearted and fearful or depressed, um, maybe experiencing grief or broken relationships or struggles with illness or unanswered prayer. Whatever it is that is on your heart, God knows. He does know and he calls us to remember, to look back and remember. Remember what God has done in giving, him, giving his son so that we can have new life. Remember that he's proven himself faithful throughout the scriptures. And he says he will be with us always. He will never leave us or forsake us. We need to remember that he's powerful. I mean, how much more powerful can you be than to raise somebody from, from the dead? And remember, it's uh, something I have to remember too, remember that God is God and I'm not. I might not understand why or what's going on, but he's God. And remember that he does deserve all of our worship, no matter what's going on in our lives. So we get to, we get to choose. We get to choose to worship, to choose to worship our faithful and powerful God in the middle of it all. And while we're waiting for the answer, even in the middle of, of the pain and the waiting, we can, we can uh, worship him. And that's just a song we'd like you to just sit and, and let the soaks, <laughs> the words soak into your hearts as you listen to the words of this song, While I Wait, I Will Worship. Deep within my heart 